Now, we are heading into our lectionary passage uh, as we prepare ourselves for the final week of the consecration. I just want to invite all of you who perhaps have not joined the consecration yet. Some of you, this may be your first time. You're like, what is the consecration? Uh, it is a 21-day fast prayer, uh, intentional engagement in the spiritual practices of our faith. If you are familiar with other traditions, if you're Muslim, it may be called Ramadan. If you are, uh, you know, Catholic, a lot of folks utilize the season of Lent, the six weeks uh, that follow uh, Ash Wednesday all the way to uh, Resurrection Sunday. We will, uh, you know, engage in uh, Lent as well and have another focus just on uh, some reflection and, 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 and whatnot. And so these are practices that every major religious tradition uh, engages in, a time to literally uh, acknowledge that God, I want to be more positioned uh, through the spiritual practices that are as eternal or certainly as, as old as uh, human beings' existence. There's always been this sense that there are ways that I and we can uh, engage in certain behaviors and actions that uh, make us more aligned with the transcendent. And certainly we as followers of Jesus, we name that to be Jesus. We name the God of all creation uh, to be active and to be alive and to be present among us. And we want to be in alignment with God. And alignment takes effort takes intentionality. Uh, alignment rarely happens by accident. Somebody say amen, right? I don't know, how many of you remember, Lord help me not to be too long-winded today, praise God, but I went here last week, so I get an extra 15 minutes, no, I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> but how many remember uh, antennas on TVs? Anybody from that, that era? Amen, I see some of y'all looking at me like, what is an antenna on a TV? It sound like my daughter. My daughter, you know, they, they, they were alive during the last vestiges of antennas with foil in my house because, you know, I was still a little too cheap to buy cable for every room. So I would have like one TV with cable. And then in my room, I would have something you could buy at Target that gave you the network channels and, and you know, and so they, you know, I was talking with them and, you know, they think I'm ancient and old and I just feel like that's a mean trick. But, um, you know, there was a time where we had to use the antenna to make sure that all of the radio, TV waves that were floating through my room could be captured by the antenna. And sometimes the antenna uh, was not positioned well. And so even with all of my intentions and with all of my aspirations, sitting in my bed trying to change the channel and I could not get a clear picture, I would have to roll out of my bed and walk all the way to the TV. I had a remote control and everything, but the remote control was not enough. I wish I could talk to somebody, amen. <laughs> the remote was not enough from my bed to get a clear picture. Even though the TV was expensive, the remote was expensive, I had to actually add a device to my TV to help make the waves in the room get in alignment with my television. And I had to sometimes move the antenna. Sometimes I was moving myself, trying to catch the wave, you know, and, and then when you caught it, you would put foil on there. I don't know why, but my dad and him told me when I was growing up, if you put foil there, it'll just solidify the thing. <laughs> like lock it in place. <laughs> I don't know if there's any science to this, praise God. <laughs> I, I, I was doing it. And then I broke down and just bought cable for all, all my, my room too. But it required intentionality. And so a consecration is our intentional effort to be in alignment with God and God's purposes and God's plans. And this passage of scripture is our lectionary passage that 
speaks in a very powerful way. Now, there's four lectionary passages that I could have preached from. One was Jonah, and I was thinking about talking about Nineveh and Jonah, but then I could only think of, you know, the United States, and I was like, mm, I need to preach something a little more hopeful to the people. So I left Nineveh out, and then uh, the, the Paul passage was a very interesting passage because it was talking about uh, how we should act living in a time where the world is changing. Uh, and, you know, I was like, hmm, I, I could do something with that. And then I read this passage that we're going to preach from Mark chapter 1, and it kind of gave me a little bit of all of it together. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 20. And so we're going to land here. I don't know if we'll have time to refer to the other passages today, but uh, you know, I do believe that we are living in some very perilous times. We're living in a time where uh, many of us, if not all of us, are conscious of how difficult life is, whether it is in world events, whether it is our own personal lives, whether it is our politics or our neighborhood or our finances or our emotions. Uh, perilous times, difficult times. And what I have come to realize is that uh, one person's tragedy feels like a catastrophe uh, to that person, uh, regardless of the general catastrophes that are happening to all of us. Uh, you can go through a thing and be like, man, you know, I don't have time to be worrying about Palestine. I got my own catastrophe in my neighborhood. I don't have time to be worrying about Ukraine. I got my own catastrophe in my family. And so um, it's not lost on me that many of us are praying for the world or our world to change. And so I read this passage in the backdrop of this sensibility that Jesus shows up in the midst of a time where the children of Israel, of the book, if you will, the, the Jewish uh, ancestors who were waiting for the Messiah to come and deliver them from the occupation, the brutal uh, ruling of the Roman Empire. Jesus shows up in the midst of this context and begins to proclaim a message that the gospel writers call good news. We, uh, some thousands of years later, follow the tradition of this particular message and messenger and savior and call and translate the good news to be the gospel. All of it together remains very important for us to grasp, I believe, if we are going to follow Jesus faithfully and find hope in the midst of our challenging world. And so this consecration, winding down one more week, inviting you and I to come into the message of the good news that has been laid before us and see how can we follow the leader towards a way of life that even amidst tragedy can provide us hope. And thus reads the word of God, Mark chapter number one, verse 14. Now after John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, the one who was proclaiming the good news or the preparing the way of Jesus to come, uh, G John preached out in the wilderness, you may remember, uh, repent, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That was the theme for our uh, Advent season. John the Baptist uh, ministering, got arrested by Herod because John the Baptist was telling Herod that he was a wicked man. And, you know, back then they didn't have a lot of freedom of speech, praise God. They they, they, they told the kings, you wicked, and the king said, okay, well, you're going to jail because we don't want, I, don't, I don't want to keep hearing that message. I want you to just stay out of my business. Amen. I hear a little bit of feedback in this mic. If you can just, uh, but don't, don't, don't take me down, just take the feedback out, praise God. Um, and so the scripture says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. 
Verse number 16, as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon, who would, you know, go on to be referred to regularly as Peter, uh, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. And as Jesus went a little further, Jesus saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat <laughs> with the hired men, and followed Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the uh, topic today, follow the leader. Follow the leader. Uh, let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. Oh, God, we ask you to hide your word in our hearts. So we will not sin against you and please allow the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus name, we pray Let the people of God say amen. Now, discipleship is one of uh, the most important tasks of the church for those who have made a decision to follow Jesus. We have a song that we sing in the church some years Ago, we bring it back every once in a while, but it says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Another verse says, Though no, no one comes with me, still I will follow. Though no one comes with me, still I will follow. Though no one comes with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Following Jesus is the primary task of the church to help form disciples, followers of Jesus. The, 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 the followers of Jesus were not called Christians uh, until very later in the book of Acts. People who followed the ways of Jesus were called followers of the way. Did you know that? Amen. That is partly why we call our church the way. We wanted to be intentional. Uh, I mean, we're not a historic, like, you know, we, we still Christians because that's what we know as. But we certainly wanted to gesture at this idea that there is the way of Jesus that is our roadmap. And while it is impossible to untangle ourselves fully from the historical uh, con continu uh, 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 continuum of Christian thought and Christian faith, we are indeed still people who are living in history. It is an act of intentionality to acknowledge that we want to be followers of the way of Jesus as an act of formation. And I hope you appreciate that it is quite a task to be formed after the way of Jesus in a world that has become so familiar with Jesus that Jesus wouldn't recognize himself in this world who constantly tries to describe him in ways Jesus would not describe himself. Now, I don't mean to be too long-winded about this point because I do want to hone in on the power of what it means to follow Jesus, but it is important to keep acknowledging that there are a lot of versions of Jesus running around in the world today. Some folk got a version of Jesus where he's holding a machine gun. And, I'm, and, 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 and it's like, you know, I love Jesus and my gun. 
And I'd be like, okay. Some folk got a version of Jesus wrapped in an American flag. I love Jesus and my country. Like, okay. Some folk got Jesus with pale eyes, blonde hair, with a bad perm. Somebody say amen. And, <laughs> and they, they, they think Jesus <laughs> looks like them. And I'm like, okay. Now, you know, I'm not too preoccupied with the uh, color of Jesus beyond it just being a historical fact that he definitely was melanated. Amen. But I am concerned about what is at stake when we attribute violence, when we attribute aesthetic value, when we attribute patriotism to following the savior of the world <laughs> who literally told his disciples, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword, put your sword away. You know, that's what Jesus said. Like, Jesus, you know, they was trying to come for Jesus. You know, I just want you to think about uh, how Jesus could have called the armies of heaven, because we believe Jesus, you know, had that kind of power. Or let's say, you know, Jesus had a little band of, you know, homies. They was packing. At least one of them was. So I think there probably was some other folk who probably had some good or mean intentions, like, don't be messing with my Savior. How, how many of you like that? Don't, don't be playing about my Jesus. I don't play about my Jesus, you know. <laughs> you like, calm down, bro. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus don't need your help <laughs> to, to defend him. That's why I don't get an argument with people about Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I'm like, well, you know, you, you, you take that up with Jesus. You know, I'm just going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to be out here arguing with you about Jesus. We had some, some uh, who the people that were, the, the Q code, the Israelites, Hebrew Israelites. I was at Allen Temple last week preaching for their MLK service. And thank you to Pastor Tanisha for preaching last Sunday. Just an amazing message. Ain't she just, that's a preacher right there, amen. Just call her three days before, and she got a, she got a sermon just, just waiting, just cooking, amen. I'm at Allen Temple preaching. At, at their Martin Luther King service and the Hebrew Israelites, you know, if you don't know the Hebrew Israelites, you know, these are some folk, some, I, I don't, I used to say they were well-meaning, but I don't know what they, what their purpose is in life. But, you know, they showed up and they was just, you know, outside the church with bullhorns and they wanted to meet with us. And, you know, because Pastor Jackie's my friend, you know, and I just got done preaching. It's like, we want to meet with the pastor. Now, they don't believe in women pastors, women ministers. And so I was like, well, if you're going outside to meet the Hebrew Israelites, then I'm coming with you, praise God, because, you know, uh, I don't play about my Jesus. I'm just playing. So, <laughs> so you know, we, we, we were nonviolent. It was Martin Luther King Day, but, you know, I just, I just want to make sure that, you know, if, if things get a little hairy, you got somebody who, you know, believe in nonviolence, just don't push me, right? It's that kind of practice of nonviolence. But the whole point is that, you know, sometimes there are people who like to push you, you know, and make you feel like you just got to be on the defensive. And, 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 and so it's just important to realize that Jesus had people in his crew who were, you know, some rough riders, praise God, folk who weren't afraid of nobody, and pulled out a sword to try to fight a whole Roman centurion group of soldiers coming to get Jesus. Jesus told them, put it away. So Jesus had the host of heaven, and he had his own little group of hitters. So one like Jesus didn't have a choice about using violence to save his own life. He said, no. No, no, no. No, y'all, y'all, y'all chill. I got this. Right? And 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 so for us to take that Jesus and make that Jesus a warmongerer is a bastardization of Jesus. Right? And so it's just always important to appreciate that we have to at times dechurchify ourselves, uncouple some of these associations that we make with Jesus because they just don't fit with the message and ministry of Jesus. 
And I have found it's a lifelong process. I'm not somebody who has, you know, totally unentangled and uncoupled myself from the Western, imperialized, colonized version of Christianity. But I know I'm conscious that there's some things that I need to wear loosely <laughs> as I follow Jesus, right? Because some of it may actually not allow me to follow Jesus faithfully. And that's what I want you and I as a church. We want to follow Jesus faithfully. Perfection is not the requirement for following Jesus. Faithfulness is. Which just means that, God, I am putting my best foot forward every day. And I know that because I'm not going to do it perfectly, that I'm going to have to use practices called repentance. I'm going to have to learn to say I'm sorry. Be generous with saying I'm sorry. Not just walk around here and be like, oh, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, God gave me a revelation. I can cuss you out today because... You know, you, you, God knows my heart. No. No. God does know your heart. That's why God introduced repentance. You being able to say, I'm sorry. Learn to say, I'm sorry to your partner, your spouse, your children, your boss. Please say sorry to your boss and keep your job. Amen. <laughs> say sorry to your friends. Say sorry to people. When they let you know that you have done harm to them. Don't just be, oh, you know, man, I don't, you know, I got to say sorry. Who are you? I ain't got to say sorry to you. And blah, blah. No, don't, 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 don't take on a posture where your piety becomes a blockade of you following Jesus. Because to follow Jesus means that you and I are in a constant state of transformation. Through the power of the spirit. And that means everything has to stay on the table. We don't just arrive at being perfect followers of Jesus. Even to be holy is not about perfection. To be holy is to be set apart. It means God has literally taken you and set you apart from everything in the world. Not just so you can be set apart, but set you apart for God's special purposes. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, you look mighty holy today, praise God. you you like, God has set you apart. And I want you to know, it's a blessing to be set apart by God. Woo. It's a blessing to be conscious that God of everybody in my family, you set me apart. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not walking around all holier than now. I just know that there's a special purpose I must do in the world. Yeah. All the hell I had to go through, all the challenges I had to, to make it through. God, you set me apart. Yeah. What should have killed me, I'm still standing. Why? Because you set me apart. Yeah. And the great thing about it is, God is extending the same invitation God gave to you. He's extending it to everybody in your life. So it's not as if God set you apart and left everybody else behind. Oh, McBride, you so special. I just want you. No. The scripture says, for God so loved the world. That's why Jesus can't be wrapped in an American flag. Because what about every other country in the world? Now, I, I guess you could wrap Jesus in the flag as long as you wrap every flag in the world around Jesus. But then that, that, that means that, you know, we are actually demoting Jesus to a nationalistic association. When Jesus is bigger than the United States of America, bigger than Russia and China and, and the Congo and Sudan and Israel and, and, and every other country you want to name, God so loved the world. So to follow Jesus means that my patriotism has its limits. I am a patriot as long as I am a steward of the country in which I happen to be born and live in in 2024. 
And there's some folk who had such problems with this country that they call themselves expats. <laughs> I may be one of those one day. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go live in another country. <laughs> and while I'm there, I'm going to have to what? Follow Jesus in that country. Faithfully. Hello, somebody. So if the country starts to balkanize like other democracies have done over the last couple hundred years or other empires, they'll start breaking apart and we have the Republic of California. The, I don't know, Empire of Texas. and uh, You know, everybody who follows Jesus in those spaces still have to follow the leader. And so how do we follow the leader well? Well, according to this passage, Jesus literally grown, raised, coming of age in the Roman Empire. Conscious that there's a Caesar, an emperor, who has imposed a way of life on his national group, his people, and Jesus is trying to call everyday people into a life with him. Scripture says Jesus is walking along the way. And as he's walking, he sees fishermen. It doesn't say Jesus was on a recruiting trip. It doesn't say Jesus put out applications. Jesus had a big billboard. Come! No, Jesus is walking through Galilee, just walking around. Kind of like you and I, we'd be walking down the street through East Oakland, West Oakland, North Richmond, South Berkeley, UC Berkeley. We're just walking along, and the scripture says, Jesus sees some fellas casting their nets, and Jesus says, hey, come and follow me. Now, I need you to appreciate how radical of an encounter this is. Because it don't say that these fellas knew Jesus. Don't he say Jesus was kind of a known dude? Jesus said, hey, come follow me. And I'm sure that for the purposes of this text, I'm sure there was some kind of conversation. I'm sure there was some kind of compelling dialogue. But the scripture says immediately they left their nets and went to follow Jesus. Jesus seeks us out in the course of our everyday lives, inviting us, first point, to leave and to follow. To leave and to follow. I want you to appreciate that the message of Jesus to all of us continuously is to leave some things, some people, some places, some ideas, beliefs, practices, and follow Jesus. Now, what I appreciate again about this text is that whatever dialogue happened, is left up to our Holy Ghost imagination. So you can fill in your own version of the conversation you know Jesus is having with you today about what you need to leave and follow. Some things that we hold fast to cannot Cling to you in this next season of your life. And I know it's hard for some of us because we've gotten used to what we've been holding on to. Quiet as it's kept, that thing holds on to us much more firmly than we hold on to it. But maybe not. Just gonna let you wrestle with your own situation. Whatever it is, Jesus is calling out to some of us as we walk 
along the course of our journey to leave and to follow. And I wonder, beloved, how close are we to being able to immediately do so? There's so many things that I have had to wrestle to release in order to follow Jesus well. People, places, things, behaviors, ideas, practices, sensibilities, hatred, anger, fear, pain, malice, violence. Did I say anger already? Oh, yeah, I think I did. I had to leave some of this stuff behind in order to follow Jesus well. And when you don't leave these things behind, then you may say you're following Jesus. You may even believe you're following Jesus. But you are very close to being such a, the word in scripture is hypocrite. But the better word, or another word, is out of alignment. See, I want us to be in alignment with Jesus, especially right now. Because Jesus is not a warmonger, which just means that we cannot be in favor of wars. Just raging all across the world with our tax dollars in our name as a proud follower of Jesus. There ought to be some kind of internal discomfort with people dying, with, with babies. And, and I want you to understand this. What we have seen on our social media feeds from Palestine, Israel, is happening in many other conflicts. But we, we like Ukraine, do you realize we've been sending hundreds of million dollars? Like, this is where a lot of the, 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 the angst among a lot of people started around our military spending because, you know, the, I, I was talking to somebody and they were, you know, talking to me about, you know, all kind of polit political stuff. And I said, the greatest line of political education and formation in the hip hop generation was Tupac saying they got money for wars wow. and not the poor. You got Pookie in there. <laughs> they don't know nothing about no foreign policy. They don't know any other country on the map except for East Oakland. They don't know the names of the four branches of the military, or is it three? I don't know. But they do know that there's something wrong with us sending hundreds of millions of dollars to fight wars in other countries while we who live here in the United States of America are watching the explosion of unhoused tent cities and, and ra raising rents and people without health care and drowning in student loans. Like, like, like even Pookie can understand it because a prophet named Tupac made it plain for him. Hello, somebody. So I'm just saying, like, you know, if, if Tupac can convince Pookie, why hasn't Jesus yet convinced Christians that you can't follow Jesus and be a warmonger and be called a faithful follower of Jesus? It just means that the next uh, uh, thing that you got to do is repent and believe. So if leaving and following means that I can't stay in this environment and follow Jesus well, repenting, right, in the Greek is called metanoia, which just means that I am going in one direction. And some folks say, you make a turnaround. Yes, Lord. Amen. <laughs> it, it, it don't mean you make a 360 degree turn. 
Because you could make a 300 and still keep going in the same direction. Metanoia means that you make a 180 degree turn and you start walking in the other direction. Repent and believe is the actions that follow the follower of Jesus who is constantly going through a state of transformation. One of the books of letters attributed to John the disciple says that we are constantly being transformed into the image of Christ, which just means that your whole life as you follow Jesus, you get transformed into, I hope, I anticipate, I expect a better version of you. Now, a better version of you means that you got a lot more capacity to love. Somebody say, God, make me better. A better version of you means that you have more capacity for joy. Somebody say, God, make me better. A greater version of you means that you have more capacity for patience and goodness and service. You know, things that we call in our tradition the fruit of the spirit. God, you are constantly changing me into your image as I follow you. So if I follow in Jesus and I start out as a warmonger, if I'm following Jesus and I start off as an abuser, if I'm following Jesus, I start off as a liar and a cheater and a hustler. The more I follow Jesus, the more I repent, make a 180 and believe. What am I believing? The scripture says the good news. What is the good news? According to Jesus, this passage that the kingdom of God, God's new order, has broken into the world, and you get to be a part of it. <laughs> now, I heard of, like, you know, gangs and cliques and groups. You know, we work with these folks to try to get them to stop, you know, shooting one another and whatnot. And, 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 and I'm glad that we are re-engaging the uh, what we call Operation Ceasefire in the city of Oakland to make sure we can intentionally, somebody say intentionality, right? Engage our young men and increasingly women and, and others who are caught in cycles of violence. That is an expression in my mind of trying to help folk repent. But I have found that people don't make a change unless they have a belief that actually catalyzes their change. We say in our organizing that the first revolution is an internal revolution. How many know that we waiting on the world to change and God's waiting on us to change? God's waiting on you to change. God's waiting on us to become more like him. Again, would you just say that God, you know, I know that there's people that I can love easily. They mostly agree with me. They mostly like what I like. They mostly live where I live sometimes, maybe, temporarily. How many know people, people in your life, there's some people that's easy to love, easier? Then there's some folk that seem like God or the devil, one of the two, have put them in your life on assignment to remind you <laughs> that you got a long way to go <laughs> to be like Jesus. Because your love for them is not very good. <laughs> your love for them is not very broad. Yo, 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 yo. Yeah, I think you got a soundtrack. Yeah. Your, your, your capacity to have peace when you're around them is a little shaky. And so part of what the process of being like Jesus requires sometimes a little catalyst. Whew. That's why I, be, I try to pass my test the first time. 
God, you bring me this test, just please. <laughs> Help me pass it the first time because I don't want to keep flunking this test. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to have to keep learning this lesson over and over and over again. I need a new belief system. Politically, some of us need a new belief system. Intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, we are too wedded to a way of thinking. In our drug and alcohol classes, we call it stinky thinking. Just habits you picked up along the way that you kind of think they work for you, but they don't, but you just kind of like have gotten used to it. A radical reorientation, Dr. King called it, of values. So, leaving and following and repenting and believing leads us to my final point, and then we'll spend some time in prayer, that God invites us to embrace our call. How do you follow the leader well? You start or come to the realization that God is calling you to a higher way of life. Some of our post-Christian or, you know, not so religious people, they use words like vibrations now, you know. It's the higher vibration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, that's a better way to describe it? Yes. You need to go higher <laughs> from where you are today. I just want you to understand what I'm saying. All of us. Everybody say all of us. Because none of us have a right. I want you to know that you can have every single social, uh, 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 societal uh, 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 classification and celebration and acknowledgement and you still have higher places. God is inviting us to go. And Jesus is calling you to a higher place of living. We need more peaceful people in our communities. We need people who can resolve conflict without resorting to violence. We need people who can see their so-called enemies suffering and saying, you know what, I'm going to take my foot off their neck. And give them a chance to live. We need a better process to Deal with our conflicts. I'm not just talking about what's happening in foreign countries. I'm talking about what's happening in your world. Like your world. On your job, in your family, in the neighborhood, within yourself. A better way to deal with conflict. Because when we've been socialized to violence, you will harm even yourself. And not know that it is because you have not gotten better ways to live at a higher way of life. And, and what I love about Jesus in this passage, Jesus meets them as fishermen. Jesus don't tell them to stop being a fisherman. Jesus says, I'm going to make you a different kind of fisher. You fishing for fishes, I'm going to have you fish for people. And, and, and this is the learning that I took from this. This is my, my final two or three paragraphs. <laughs> we all have our careers, but do we all have a vocation? We all have something we do that benefits us, our family, our own kind of sense of, you know, feeling productive. But do we have 
a way to be in the world where we're able to bless people and not get anything back in return. We all have the things we're required to do. But what are the things that you voluntarily do? Jesus says, don't stop being a fisher. I'm going to make you a fisher of people. And you want to know something? Jesus was only best guest, not guest, best guest. Ministry lasted three, three and a half years. So everyone Jesus interacted with who followed Jesus only really followed him physically for a short period of time. They eventually had to go back into the world, their world, and live still in an occupation, live still among their family, live still within their employment or their career, live still under very difficult human circumstances, and still follow Jesus. We have church because we are trying to make disciples, but I'm not trying to make church your life. I need you to go into the world and follow Jesus in the world. <laughs> Ain't that something? And guess what? Even if we were to have church, you know, because, you know, there's some verses of church where it's just like, you know, church is your life. And some of us are called to that. That's great. But you still have a career, a way you need to exist in a capitalistic society. You still got to make your money, you still got to take care of your family, all those things. But can you do so and follow Jesus at the same time? That's the question. Follow Jesus well. Follow Jesus faithfully. Follow Jesus in a way that keeps you wrestling with the, what are the things I must leave? So I can follow Jesus well. Keep you wrestling with what are the things I must believe so I can repent? How can I embrace the call of God and live on a transcendent higher vibration? So I can follow Jesus well. Because follow Jesus don't mean all your life challenges just end. Guess what? People follow Jesus still going to die one. People follow Jesus, they still gonna get sick. People follow Jesus, gonna have to live in a terrible political environment. Jesus, people who follow Jesus, gonna have to deal with enemies and haters. Y'all know I don't preach on haters because I feel like that's such a low vibrational conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to learn how to follow Jesus. Because if you follow Jesus well, then all of these things become the background. It is not to say they don't affect you. I don't like when people talk about me. I don't like when challenges come my way. I don't like when relationships get difficult. But I do love that I have decided yeah. to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And that is what I want us in this season of consecration to make a decision again and again and again to follow Jesus. Then again, follow Jesus, I just want to clarify, it does not mean you become this, this deep and spooky, I see dead people, I'm always on the lookout for the devil, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm condemning you to hell, and, and, and I, I'm keeping track of all the things you don't do, and I'm I, you know, always trying to figure out which sin you caught up in, and I'm wondering, did you get baptized the right way? Do you got the right doctrine? Is your theology in alignment with, no, that, I mean, you know, elements of that could be a part of it, but it is in the extreme minority of the pie. <laughs> following Jesus. We follow Jesus. And as we follow Jesus, 
we become more like Jesus. What good news must we hear in the midst of all the bad news surrounding us? So we can cultivate hope. Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, I'm giving you a new message, a new framework. I'm giving you something to latch on to in the midst of all the bad news. Why? Because I want to cultivate hope in you. Patrick Stephan Chen said, God wants to cultivate hope in me. God wants you to be and remain hopeful in difficult circumstances. God wants you to understand that in this season of difficulty, if I keep following Jesus, I don't escape difficulty. I learn how to exist within it more faithfully so I don't harm other people even though I'm going through a difficult situation. My vocation can run alongside my career. I can be a blessing to some people. I can help somebody. I can live at a transcendent way and not get bogged down and pulled into the ugliness of the world. Are there parts of your journey that require a 180 degree turn? What people, places, things? must be held loosely on you as we learn to follow Jesus. Can you make a distinguishing acknowledgement, recognition between your career and your vocation? Because the kingdom of God has come to the world. We who follow Jesus are part of God's kingdom. Some womanist, radical womanist theologians don't like kingdom, it feels too imperialistic, so they say kingdom, which feels more relational. Again, the words matter. Whatever resonates with you, the purpose, the function is to say, oh, using the Paul passage that I didn't preach from today, that the world is changing. How will we live in this world as it changes? My prayer is that we will be a people who stand against violence in all its forms. That we'll be a people who are generous and kind, who forgive ourselves and others, who love the unlovable, who reach out to the destitute, who acknowledge that we are not perfect so we can acknowledge when we're wrong and say we're sorry. People who can recognize that in the course of my everyday life, Jesus is calling me to follow him. And as the scripture says, we can't immediately do so. Stand with me, everyone, and let's take a few moments and ask the Lord to seal this message in our hearts. Grab the hand of someone or touch their elbow or shoulder and say, I have decided. I have decided. God, I pray for the person who I'm touching today. I pray that the ultimate decision to follow you by repenting, making a U-turn, acknowledging that the way I'm going is not the way that is following you. And so, God, I need a new belief system. I want to confess with my mouth. I want to believe in my heart. I want to acknowledge that you, God, are the creator of the universe, and you brought salvation to the world. Jesus, you saved the world. And by saving the world, you extend this offer of salvation to me. So God, I pray the person I'm touching may this offer be extended to them. If they've not yet made the decision to follow you, I pray God, even right now, they'll say yes. We who have made the decision to follow you, Lord, you know how hard it is to follow you in these times. The you that loves, the you that heals, the you that forgives, the you that embraces the you that is hope. 
So God, I pray for my beloved person I'm touching who've lost hope in this season, who've lost a sense of faith in this season, who are tortured and tormented by the catastrophes in their own lives or the lives of others. God, I pray that you will become so concrete in their consciousness that it will be impossible for them to deny that you are inviting them into a way of life that meets their every need. We want to exist in this broken world in a way that does not break us. We want to live in this hateful world in a way that does not rob us of love. We want to live in this wicked world in a way that does not rob us of righteousness, the love of justice and peace. And so God, I pray that my beloved neighbor will be reminded that we can follow you in a fallen world faithfully. Lift your hands now. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. I need your peace, I need your joy, I need your love, I need your power, I need your strength, I need your forgiveness, I need your salvation, I need you. I need you to restore my hope, I need you to restore my peace. I need you, God, to give me that which I need to make it through these hard times. I need you to block out, Lord God, the people, places, and things that keep me from following you faithfully. I need you, God. I need you in a real way. So, God, don't forsake me. Don't ignore me, God. I call out to you, and I trust that you hear my prayer. And I know, God, that you are able to do that which I ask today. May I follow you, God. Hallelujah. May I say yes to you. May I realize you in my daily existence. And I'll say thank you, Lord. I pray for those who are sick today and they need healing. I rebuke sickness in the name of Jesus. I call for healing in the name of Jesus. Healing from cancer, healing from diabetes, healing from pressure, healing from COVID healing from respiratory illness. God, you can still heal. You still sustain. Do it, God. Do it immediately through the power of instantaneous healing. Do it through the medical miracles, God. Do it through the work of doctors and hospitals. Do it through medicines. Do it through good information. Heal us so we can be healed. Keep our friendships, our marriages, our relationships. Lord, our, 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 our interactions with our children. Keep these things whole. Keep them healthy. Keep them transparent. Keep them vibrant. Keep them life-giving. So we don't have to walk in this cold world alone. Do it for us, God. Bless us on our jobs and our careers but awaken a vocation so we can serve others. Save us. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Heal us. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Deliver us. Somebody say, deliver me, Lord. And we know we will follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back, no turning back. I will follow the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands if you believe it today. I'm following Jesus. I'm following Jesus. I'm following Jesus. I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to talk with Jesus. I'm going to exist with Jesus. Wherever I am, I'm carrying Jesus with me everywhere I go. The words of Jesus, the sensibilities of Jesus, the principles of Jesus. I'm going to carry it with me because I know it transforms. I know it makes whole. 
I know it fixes terrible situations. Woo! I feel good about following Jesus today. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!